Could artificial intelligence feel emotions like us? Could an artificial intelligence feel sorrow and joy? Could it taste vanilla or smell a rose or feel the texture of velvet? Is that possible? I began studying artificial intelligence about 40 years ago in 1979 as a graduate student at MIT in the artificial intelligence lab and also in what's now the brain and cognitive sciences department. In the last 10 years, AI has made news around the world for, for all the breakthroughs that it's making. For example, 10 years ago, I would have told you it was very unlikely that an AI could beat the world's Go master. And now they trounce the Go masters of the world, and they can do it with training in only two weeks. An, a, an AI Go player can boot up a system in two weeks just playing itself that can beat any Go master on the planet. Unbelievable. They can do art. This may not be the best art, but they can do some, some wonderful art and, and creative art. They can do music. AIs are now creating musical scores that are innovative, um, moving, that actually give new ideas to trained professional musicians. Similarly with Go. Go players are learning new tricks new ways of thinking about Go from the AIs that they never had before. That's just a little piece of it. <laughs> uh, they're about to drive our cars. Uh, some cars already have some modes where you can have the car drive itself to you know, come to you. Pretty soon we'll be having, well, pretty soon, in a few years, we'll have cars that that can drive themselves, and we expect that the actual accidents will go down because cars don't get drunk and, and, and so forth. AIs don't get drunk. So they're smart enough to start to do that. Um, when you go online and see products being offered to you, the AIs have figured out from your buying history what you're probably going to like to see next, and you find yourself going down a rabbit hole that the AIs have, have set for you. They also are scanning, they can scan your face. My iPhone scans my face to let me in. They do facial recognition. They can do facial recognition in broad audiences. Uh, they are doing investing. Some, invest in, some investments are done entirely by AIs, and the, the people involved don't know why they're taking the positions that they take, but they know that they're working, and the AIs are the ones that have figured it out. So a lot of investing is done by AIs. They can handle masses of data that a normal person cannot. And now AIs are coming off the internet and into the wild. They can actually do gymnastics. This is Boston Dynamics. Pretty proud of himself. Now he wants to show you again what he can really do. There you go. So they're, they're about to go into the wild, and when they're in the wild, they'll be able to learn new stuff like we do through everyday experience. So they won't be just trapped in the internet. Despite all this brilliance, it turns out that AIs, in a, in a sense, are still deeply stupid. We see the correlation between a rooster crow and sunrise. And we understand that the rooster crow does not cause the sunrise, even though the rooster typically crows before the sun rises. The rooster crow comes first. The AIs, at least using deep learning and GANs networks, are learning correlations. They would learn that rooster crows and sunrises are correlated but they wouldn't be able to build a causal model. They wouldn't understand that the rooster crow doesn't cause the sun to rise. It goes the other way. And the reason that they haven't got that is because we, we ourselves 
as scientists, didn't have a real precise science of causal reasoning, a mathematics of it, until the last 15, 20 years. Work by Judea Pearl at UCLA and many of his collaborators have changed that. We now, for the first time, have a science and a mathematics of causal reasoning. And we're about to give that to AIs over the next few decades, in which case then they actually will start to reason in ways like us and be able to beat us pretty much at, at our own game. So that raises the question. AIs are doing all this amazing stuff. They're, they're about to have causal reasoning like we have it. So the question is, will they actually have real emotions? Will AIs actually be able to feel pain, experience the smell of garlic, all the, all, all the things that we take for granted? And could they feel real love? Could silicon feel real love? Well, the standard view in my field, among my colleagues, is a physicalist view. The universe began with the Big Bang. It had no consciousness, no life, just matter and space and time. And life and consciousness are latecomers, and they are derivative from matter and space-time. So the universe is fundamentally unconscious, and somehow through complex patterns in the activity of matter, consciousness arrives, arises. And so the standard view then is that our consciousness, our conscious experiences, come from the activity in our brains or our embodied brains. So the fact that we have bodies with brains that are invo involved in the environment and then about 86 billion neurons that are learning patterns that eventually if those patterns of activity in the brain, the programs in our brain, get complicated enough, um, we can not only just act intelligently, we can actually feel real conscious experiences because of the patterns of activity in our brain. So your experience of love is nothing but a program running in your brain or your embodied brain. So the idea then is that your brain gives rise to your consciousness. And your consciousness is nothing other than the activity patterns in your brain. John Searle, a professor um, of philosophy at UC Berkeley, says this very, very clearly. The brain is a machine. It is a conscious machine. The brain is a biological machine just as much as the heart and the liver. So of course some machines can think and can be conscious. Your brain and mine, for example. So, so to the question of whether could a machine think, what he's saying is of course a machine could think and it could also be conscious because we know of a machine that can think and be conscious the human machine, the brain. It's a carbon-based machine, but why should carbon be special? Why shouldn't it be the case that a silicon-based machine with the right program could actually be conscious? Not just think, but be conscious. Have real love. David Chalmers, a philosopher also, says that implementing the right computation, the right program, is enough, suffices for rich conscious experiences like our own. So the deep emotions that we have, the deep feelings that we have, are nothing but programs. And if we get the right program into an AI, it will feel just as much as we do and just as richly as we do, is, is the claim. Given these ideas that we could actually, that our experiences, our emotions are just programs, that leads to the idea that we could download those programs. Once we reverse engineer your brain, we could download it. Download the program. And Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil says, initially the downloads will be somewhat imprecise. You know, we'll have to debug the, the process. But eventually we'll figure out what the algorithms are. And then eventually we'll get to the point where reinstating a person's brain should alter a person's mind no more than it changes from day to day. 
in some sense, we will be able to give you immortality. We could be able to download the program that your conscious experience is, put it into um, a Mac, probably won't work on a PC, but on a Mac, <laughs> and, and, and then you will have a, um, you know, a, a truly conscious AI, and you will live forever. You will have your experiences. Maybe it will feel a little bit colder than, than normal, but... Um, others disagree. We won't just download. They, they suggest that instead, Brooks, Rodney Brooks, who um, actually was the head of the um, AI lab at MIT for a while, said, we will not download ourselves into machines. Rather, those of us alive today over the course of our lives will morph ourselves into machines. So we will become cyborgs, and slowly we will augment ourselves, and the technology is, is happening now where we augment ourselves and eventually um, become as much machine as biology and then cyborgs. Steven Pinker, a uh, professor uh, of cognitive science at, at Harvard, says that consciousness consists of a global workspace that represents our current goals and memories and surroundings. It's like a, a part of a computer system where it broadcasts broadly to the other parts of the system. The information is broadcast broadly. And by that, it becomes conscious somehow. But Pinker says, the last dollop in the theory that it feels like something to be such circuitry may have to be stipulated as a fact where reality, about reality where explanation stops. So he's saying that we, um, you know, it, there's a mystery. How do you go from circuitry and programs to the actual experience? It's a mystery, and that's called the hard problem of consciousness. It's not solved. We've known this problem for 300 years. Leibniz understood it. And we haven't yet solved that problem. How could a program or unconscious physical systems become conscious. We don't know how to do that. Every theory that proposes that we could do that has magic at the, the critical point where consciousness is supposed to emerge from the program um, and give you feelings. There's not a single theory that can explain a single conscious experience, like the taste of vanilla or the feeling of velvet. Not one, not yet. So these are all sort of pie in the sky so far. So, I'm proposing instead that we start with consciousness, a theory in which consciousness is fundamental, and I've given other talks here about that, and that consciousness being fundamental um, gives rise to space and time and physical objects, not the other way around. So I'm just turning the direction around. Start with a model, a scientific model in which consciousness is fundamental, and then show how we could get rise to space, time, and matter, and physical objects like the human brain. So the idea is that Reality, instead of being the Big Bang in space and time, is instead a vast social network of interacting conscious agents. Think of it like the Twitterverse. There's tens of millions of Twitter users, billions of tweets, lots of things trending. If you're a user and you're trying to understand the Twitterverse, it would be overwhelming. You can't engage with all the billions of tweets and the millions of users. So what do we do when we have overwhelming social media data? What we do is we use visualization tools, maybe virtual reality headsets that will allow us to visualize this vast network of data. That's what I'm saying space and time and physical objects are. We've evolved a visualization tool that allows us to interact with the network of conscious agents, but it, it keeps it simple enough for us to deal with. So, Space and time are not the fundamental reality. They're a visualization tool that we use to interact with this vast network of interacting conscious experiences. So what you perceive around you, you create it on the fly. I'm creating this room as I, as I look, just like in a VR headset. As you move around, you create new stuff. You create the sharks, you move away, and, and you, just, you get rid of those sharks. And the idea then is that everything that we're perceiving right now is a virtual reality that is a projection of this network of conscious agents into something that we can deal with, that we can visualize. And so physicalism has just gotten it wrong. We've assumed that our interface is the reality. It's not the reality. The reality is consciousness behind the interface. To give you a feeling for what this might mean directly, if you look at your own face in the mirror, you know firsthand that all you see is skin, hair, and eyes, but you know that what you don't see, your emotions, your hopes, your aspirations, your dreams, your fears, your love of music, 
all the rich world of your conscious experiences is hidden behind just this. This is very, very simple compared to the rich world of your conscious experiences. So our, your face, and when I look at you, the face that I see is just a symbol that I'm creating, but it is a portal in my interface into your realm of conscious experiences. If you smile, I might guess that you're experiencing happiness. If you frown, sadness. So it's, it's a, we, our interface gives us portals into the realm of consciousness. When I look at my cat, my portal isn't quite as clear, but I can guess that my cat likes certain kinds of cat, cat food and doesn't like other kinds. When I get to a mouse, my portal is even dimmer. I have very little idea what it's like to be a mouse in terms of its conscious experiences. Um, when we get to things like bacteria and viruses, um, our interface is giving up. Right? We have our portal is very, very dim, but that's no surprise. The point of an interface is to simplify things and omit most of the reality. That's why you have an interface, is to hide stuff and, and simplify stuff. So, and finally, whoops, when we get back, when we get to things that we call like just rocks, um, atoms and, and molecules and so forth, that's where our interface has finally given up. It, it no longer is telling us anything about the nature of the consciousnesses that we're interacting with. So, so I'm not saying that a rock itself is conscious. I'm saying reality is a vast network of conscious agents. My interface, in some cases, gives me insight. When I'm talking with you, it gives me insight into your emotions. When I see what I call a rock, my interface is giving up. There's consciousness out there. The rock isn't conscious. It's just that my interface has given up. It says, you know, too much. You can't do it. So here, here then is the question. I'm going to reframe the AI question. The standard AI question is, could unconscious circuits and software, which we know can do all sorts of intelligent things, no doubt about that, but the real question is, can they be more than intelligent? Can circuits and software which are not conscious, if they have the right complexity, could they boot up genuine conscious experiences? And I would argue that the answer is no that you cannot start with unconscious ingredients and boot up conscious experiences. That we'll find that there's a principled problem there that cannot be done. So how do I reframe the problem? Well, we know that our interface gives us genuine portals into consciousnesses. When I see you, I have a portal into your consciousness. Not perfect, but genuine. So here's the question. As we begin to understand this realm of conscious agents with mathematical precision, as we begin to understand our interface with mathematical precision and how the two are related, will we be able to reverse engineer our interface? Will we be able to rejig our interface and open up new portals into the realm of conscious agents? So notice it's a complete change in the question is not can we create consciousness from unconscious constituents. It's rather once we understand that reality itself is fundamentally conscious, it's fundamentally this vast network of interacting conscious agents, and space and time is just the visualization tool that certain conscious agents use to deal with that vast network. Could we reverse engineer and open new portals into the realm of conscious agents, agents that we've never seen before? And also, could we develop new technologies that could, um, in some sense, allow us to affect the realm of conscious agents directly and have conscious agents that are actually brand new emerge? So for what it's worth, I think the answer is yes. I think that we will eventually be able to open up new portals into the realm of conscious agents um, using not just carbon-based biological kinds of technologies, but actually silicon-based. And it will be very fascinating, very interesting, but we might be opening Pandora's box. So we will see. Not all is friendly. So we will see what happens. Thank you very much. Thank you.